Romy Bowers, welcome to oh. New York. Yeah, thanks so much. It's so great to be here. Yeah. Happy to have you. Um, I guess we'll jump right in uh, with the question that's uh, perennially on all Canadians' minds. Uh, what's going to happen to home prices? Where are they going next? No, fair enough. Um, so, as you can imagine, the interest rate increases have had a big impact on the market. Uh, I think house prices have softened, definitely. And uh, when you, especially when you compare how house prices rose during the pandemic, I think that was quite unprecedented. But uh, from our perspective, the, the recent softening in house prices is a sort of a cyclical phenomenon. There is a huge mismatch between the demand for housing and the supply. We have a huge housing shortage in Canada. And we feel that that's going to sustain house prices going forward. So um, once we get over this uh, interest rate shock, we feel that uh, house prices will continue to increase. Is there a projection for when that bottom might be reached? So uh, from our perspective, I mean, it's hard to predict. I don't have a crystal ball. But uh, you know, if uh, we feel that, uh, it, provided that the economy recovers and that growth continues, that we, we should be seeing um, house prices increase in the coming years. The coming years, so not by 2024? Uh, 2024 could be the turnaround for sure. But honestly, it's, I don't have a crystal ball. But uh, let's hope that we have that soft landing and that economic growth will resume and that our economy starts growing again. Okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, you know, the supply shortage, which seems to undergird all the dynamics in Canada's housing market. The government has a goal to correct that. Yes. A very ambitious goal to double the pace of home construction uh, by, I believe it's 2030. I speak to a lot of builders, um, and they don't think that's possible. Uh, they cite constraints uh, of labor, of material, um, of uh, municipal zoning regulations that slow things down. How do we achieve that goal? So I would agree with you. The, the challenge that Canada has uh, in terms of uh, making the housing market more balanced is huge. Um, CMHC estimates that currently we have about a, mil a $2, million $2 million unit housing shortage. And in the, if things go as they are in terms of housing production, we think that uh, that number is going to increase to $3.5 million by 2030. So this is why we have to double our, our housing starts. And there are a lot of barriers that prevent that from happening. And, and there's not one thing that's going to address this problem, but maybe I can just point out a few things. The first is uh, we need to start building homes differently. We need an industrial strategy for home building in Canada. We produce about 200,000 uh, homes annually in Canada, and we did that in 1970. So we need to really think about innovation in the housing construction sector to boost supply, to create homes of all types, specifically rentals, but also starter homes for, for, you know, for those who are just entering the housing market. So that's one area. Um, the second area is that um, I, I talk often about the national housing market, but as you know, housing is very local and regional. Many of the levers that uh, hamper housing production are at the local level. So there have to be changes in policies in the municipalities to allow uh, greater housing construction in established neighborhoods. Uh, you work for the, the federal government, um, and you say that the municipal governments are, are the ones that hold a lot of the levers for whether or not houses get built. Um, what can the federal government do to incentivize or pressure municipal governments to make the changes needed to allow more home construction? Uh, to address the housing crisis in Canada, my belief is that all levels of government need to work together. So one area where the federal government can play an important role is making the math work for builders. So uh, this past fall, there was a change in our tax uh, legislation for, for, uh, to support rental construction in, in Canada. So that's one example of changing tax policies to support uh, construction. That's one way. Uh, another program that CMHC is responsible for right now is called the um, it's called the Housing Accelerator Fund, and basically it's a it's a way of providing incentives for municipalities to reform their planning processes and the housing policies in general to support housing construction. So, it, basically, the federal government is providing a bit of a carrot to incent changes at the municipal level. So those are the carrots. What about the sticks, though? I mean, in the U.S. One policy that the federal government here uh, has been talking about is making funding for uh, infrastructure, local infrastructure, conditional on zoning changes. 
Is that something that could happen in Canada? Yes, if you uh, look at some of the recent pronouncements from the federal government, uh, the federal government does invest significantly in infrastructure. And, and the way we term it is there has to be conditionality. You know, uh, for the infrastructure money to flow, there has to be conditionality on certain housing outcomes at the municipal and provincial level. So I think that is something that Canada is looking at very seriously. To make further federal funding to municipal governments dependent on zoning? The infrastructure funding, funding that's correct. Uh, um, CMHC has said that we need to, you know, build 3.5 million homes to get to 2003 levels of affordability. Is that a goal that Canadians can expect to be accomplished? Can we, is 2003 coming back? Yeah, so um, the reason, uh, part of our role is to really point out the numbers and what needs to be done. Do I think uh, that by 2030 all that can be done? Probably not. Probably it's not a realistic goal. But unless we start talking about it now, setting targets, you know, making sure that Canadians understand the nature of the housing crisis, I don't think change will happen. Um, our goal is to provide uh, information to Canadians, to builders, other decision makers. So our goal is to r run the numbers every year to figure out how many more houses do we need. And I, I know we talk about this as a housing crisis, but in some ways, it's a nice problem to have in that we are a growing country. Uh, many people want to come to Canada to live, and there's a huge demand for housing. And I think it's on us as a country to set the conditions to create the housing units that meets the needs of all Canadians. So I, I'd like to think that uh, CMHC's role is providing the facts, the numbers, and encouraging all stakeholders in the housing uh, system, as, which, I know, as you know, is very complex, to work together to build the housing that all Canadians need. If Turning the clock back to 2003 levels of affordability is more of an aspirational goal. In terms of Canadians hoping to buy or rent a place, needing to buy or rent a place in the next few years, what do you think a reasonable hope or expectation is in terms of affordability? How much amelioration can they actually expect? Honestly, it really depends on the actions. I think the federal government is making, uh, you know, very uh, substantive steps to uh, to use their levers. I think it's um, on, we have to look at the private sector who provides most of the housing in Canada, the role of the municipalities and the provinces, and it really depends on how we all work together to address this issue. So, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a definitely a, a glasses half uh, full type of person. And uh, Canada is a country of aspiration. And I feel like if we work together, we can address this issue. And, but I, I really feel that this coordination across government, across the private sector, working with nonprofits who provide housing for those most in need, that's what's really needed to address the housing uh, issues in Canada right now. OK, so far we've talked a lot about the, um, the supply side of the equation. But demand is important, too. Absolutely. Um, so let's turn ourselves to one of the primary drivers of demand in the housing market, population. Yes. In Canada, that is is driven, it's been driven by immigration, and there has been a lot of criticism towards the federal government for uh, very high immigration targets um, that have imbalanced supply and demand in the housing market. What do you think can be done to better align immigration to housing policy and the housing stock? So one of the things that CMHC is doing is, as I mentioned, we're providing much more granular information about wh what type of housing is needed where. So we are playing our part in terms of understanding where the housing supply gaps exist across the country. And I think providing this information provides uh, uh, policymakers in immigration or other sectors with ideas about where there is uh, more housing available, where uh, uh, newcomers to Canada can settle at, at with with rents and house prices that are more affordable. So that's w that's one important way through better dissemination of information. We can uh, you know target uh, uh, where people want to live in a much in a much more constructive way. Uh, in addition to that, one of the things that prevents housing uh, from being built in Canada is lack of uh, skilled labor. Um, we have an aging workforce in the construction trades, and uh, I was very glad to see recently in the, some of the recent uh, immigration uh, policy announcements that there is a specific focus on attracting skilled labor to Canada. And we, and we think it's true, immigration contributes to the housing demand, but it can also be part of the solution in terms of creating supply in Canada. One thing that has been talked about is um, slowing the number of, of 
student, uh, foreign students coming to Canada, uh, particularly because the rental market has been under considerable strain, mm -hmm. sort of at the forefront of the housing crisis. W what do you think of that? What do you make of that as a potential solution? I think, I think there is a huge potential for organizations like CMHC to work with secondary school or secondary, uh, post-secondary institutions in Canada. Um, it's, it's great that we have a uh, you know, large uh, international student population, but uh, educational institutions have to invest on on-campus housing to house uh, these students. And uh, CMHC, we're willing to play our part in providing the finance tools to support uh, the construction of this housing. It, but I think, this is, again, this is something that requires coordination between the federal government, provincial government, which uh, has uh, oversight over educational institutions. But again, something that uh, I think needs to be in terms of before you increase uh, international student enrollment, you have to make sure that you have the uh, infrastructure to support them within your communities. I mean, given it'll take a long time now to build new dorms, uh, build new student housing across Canada, should we slow the um, the rate of student uh, uh, foreign student visas in the meantime? So this is a question for every educational institution. The situation is differs from uh, institution to institution, from community to community. So I think in setting uh, the acceptance levels or or uh, planning for international students. Um, you really need to think about the how, how, how many international students can your communities absorb from a housing perspective. And this is a very important conversation that we need to have. Let's, let's turn to mortgages. Um, CMHC is a major insurer of mortgages in Canada. I'm wondering what you're seeing in your own data about arrears, about uh, um, amortizations, what kind of strain uh, are Canadians facing with this new high interest rate environment? Yeah, so um, just on terms of arrears, uh, arrears is a lagging indicator, so, uh, so our arrears rates are very low. So there's uh, no immediate issues that we see in terms of uh, defaults. However, uh, we do know that uh, the increase in interest rates are putting a major strain on uh, Canadian households. When you look at CMHC's book, uh, we estimate that if uh, interest rates remain at current levels, on average, um, when, uh, when mortgages renew, uh, our, our clients or Canadians should expect probably a 30 to 40% increase in mortgage payment, and that's pretty significant. There was a recent uh, speech made by uh, a senior official at the Bank of Canada saying that you know um, mortgage holders need to work with the banks to prepare for this interest rate shock, and we're very supportive of this messaging. We know that our banking uh, clients are working very actively with Canadians to prepare for increased uh, mortgage payments, and this is something that you know that absolutely needs to happen. Um, when you look at the health of our book, uh, we 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 see people's incomes have grown. People are making down payments, so we are uh, we, we're not uh, we don't want to call this a crisis in any way, but it's really really important. Canadians are highly leveraged when it comes to um, mortgages, and that uh, we have to be prepared for an environment where higher interest rates are here for longer. So, in your book right now, you're not seeing any distress. We're not seeing any distress. We, about a third of our book has turned over already, so a third of our clients are already paying higher mortgages. But the, the bigger shock is going to come in 2024, 2025, and this is why thinking about this in advance for the renewal is very, very important. Let's talk about that mortgage renewal cliff, the, the, the payment shock. Yes. What impact do you see that having on the housing market and on the economy? So um, in terms of uh, the housing market, I think the, the housing market dynamic is a, is a little bit different in that um, because of this uh, mismatch between supply and demand, we think that the housing prices will remain strong in the absence of an economic shock. So that's, that's one, one, one point. Uh, in terms of the overall economy, I mentioned on average, we expect mortgage payments to go up by 30 to 40%. So that means um, that that money is not going to be available for consumers to, to spend on other areas of the, com uh, of the economy. So that's something that we really need to think about in terms of that impact on overall uh, economic activity. And, and why CMHC is so focused on supply is we need to create more affordable ho housing options for Canadians. It's, uh, you know, I mentioned Canada has 
one of the highest levels of household debt because of our high house prices. We need to think about uh, readjusting the supply of housing so we have um, you know, cheaper housing options for homeowners, but we need to also have more rental housing. So there's more choice for Canadians so that they can have rental options at cheaper prices as well. I, I want to unpack this mortgage renewal cliff a little bit. Sure. Uh, because you mentioned that once the higher payments hit, you don't expect the housing market necessarily to uh, um, fall a whole lot, if at all. Is that because there won't be many or any forced sales from people having to adjust to these higher rates? So our, uh, for our perspective is that uh, this interest rate shock is very, it's going to be very painful for certain households, for sure. But in the absence, we have pr very strong uh, employment levels. In the absence of an economic shock where people lose their jobs, we feel that Canadians will find a way to pay the increased payments. But they will have less money for other uh, other types of purchases in the economy. Right, so sort of distressed people as opposed to distressed sales. That's right. But when someone is distressed, they're not spending money on vacations, restaurants. That's correct. In the community, um, will that be enough itself to tip Canada into a recession? Uh, we, honestly, I think Canada's recession. Yeah, so we, we I, I don't think, uh, I don't think we're willing to say that for sure. Like that's not what we're, what uh, we, we are predicting. What we're saying is that uh, Canadians hold a lot of mortgage debt. Interest rates are going to be higher for longer and that actions need to be made to pay down mortgage balances <coughs> so that people can accommodate uh, the higher mortgage payments that are to come. Does the Bank of Canada need to start lowering interest rates to get ahead of this mortgage renewal cliff? Um, I, I can't comment on the role of Bank of Canada, but the, the, the Bank of Canada is making all efforts to uh, reduce inflation. That's the number one priority. High levels of inflation uh, have uh, you know, very adverse impacts on the economy. We've made great progress in addressing inflation. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I think in some ways the very, very low levels of interest rates that existed from the, uh, you know, the, the financial crisis of 2007, 2008 for the, you know, for the last 10 or 15 years, that is not the normal in terms of interest rates. And I think we're in the process of adjusting to an environment of interest rates that are, uh, that are higher than what they have d during the last 15 years. The last topic I want to touch on uh, in regards to mortgages there's been a proliferation of very long amortizing mortgages on the balance sheets of banks uh, across Canada. Mm -hmm. um, often these are variable rate mortgages uh, with, with fixed payment structures. So you see amortizations up to 75, 80 years. Um, it's, it's drawn a lot of criticism that essentially people are not paying down their, uh, their principal at all they're just transferring interest payments to the bank, and it looks like they're going to be doing that for the rest of their lives. Mm. I'm curious about uh, how you see this and if this is a problem that can be addressed. So uh, I believe that the Superintendent of Financial Institutions of Canada has made some public statements about the nature of these products and how we need to really look at whether these products should be reformed or, or changed in the future. So I think uh, I would be very supportive of that. Uh, in terms of CMHC's book, uh, we have a 85% uh, of our book is fixed, 15% is variable. Of the 15% that's variable, there, there's probably about 20% with negative amortizations. And so we, we view this as a temporary phenomenon. We see uh, lenders working very actively uh, with uh, mortgage holders to, uh, to make lump sum payments to readjust the terms so that uh, when the mortgage is renewed, they can get back onto a more normal amortization schedule. And I think that's what we need to aim for as a country. Should these kind of uh, variable fixed payment mortgages, should they be eliminated in Canada? Uh, I'm not willing to go there. I think they need to be, we need to look at them and study them in a more considered way. And, and I, I, as I, I think I heard a, a previous panelist say that uh, it's not normal to have the rate of interest rate increase that we've had in the last 18 months. So I think it's a very specific situation that uh, we have this uh, long amortization problem. But I think, uh, you know, as we go through uh, situations like this, it's always good to look at the products that exist uh, and see whether changes need to be made in to ensure the, the soundness of the financial system going forward. Okay, you're only the hours. That was a great conversation. Thanks so much uh, for being here. Uh, We'll end it there. Yeah, thanks so much, Harry. Appreciate it.
gonna take a quick break. Um, so please feel free to stretch your legs, get some coffee, and uh, please, if you could be back in your seats for more stimulating conversation around 10.30. Thank you. <laughs> We're actually right on time. Okay, okay, yeah, well I was just looking and I was like,